Hello, hello. So this week's um, discussion is on early Korean Buddhism. Um, this is another uh, installment of our Introduction to East Asian Buddhism series. And, and I should mention on the outset that looking at Korean Buddhism on the whole, uh, within a 20 to 30 minute um, time frame is impossible. Um, and yet, here I am. <laughs> um, what I'd like to uh, highlight in this discussion is some of the history and development in Korean Buddhism, particularly um, out of all that we've already discussed um, in these last several months worth of discussions with, uh, of the schools coming out of China. Um, because uh, as we'll see, even though Korea has its own distinct culture and history, Buddhism on the whole contributed uh, uh, continued based on what was being started in, in China. Um, it was being imported almost immediately after its introduction into China, and similar schools of thought developed alongside what was going on in China at the time. And these in turn influenced what was being exported to Japan in the subsequent centuries. That is to say that many of the schools of thought and practice um, can be seen developing at the same time as they were in China, although in their own Korean sort of way. So with that, a little bit of context. Slide, please. Um, FYI, for those who don't know, uh, Korea is very close to China. Um, some might say it's even a peninsula off of the coast of China. Um, and smack dab between Chinese, uh, the China and, and um, uh, Japanese islands there off to the, to the right. Um, and, um, and so accordingly, it was continually influenced from um, Chinese uh, influences from before even the turn of the common era. Um, early Korean kingdoms could be described as almost vassal-like states um, of their la much larger neighbor, only because those kingdoms did look to China as a bigger, big brother of sorts, um, and therefore readily adopted various cultural, political, and academic exports from China. Uh, and Mu Song, uh, have a book, it's, uh, he has a great um, book uh, called Thousand Peaks about Korean, um, Korean Zen history. Um, and he makes the point that this early Buddhist adoption was probably due to two main factors. Um, a, that there was already a receptive attitude towards importing and adopting Chinese cultural trends, and B, an outshoot of that, that Buddhist teachings would have already been found permeating into the region before its formal introduction into the peninsula. Traveling along the Silk Road um, and, and other trade routes and having geographic proximity, not just Buddhist teachings were spreading into the peninsula. Much was being shared during these early periods, and into the future. With this said, the dates given uh, for when Buddhism was formally introduced in the various kingdoms at that time implies a spread of Buddhist teachings exceedingly early on. China was uh, only just beginning um, to be exposed to Buddhism itself through the turn of the common era into the third century, but by many of the, but many of the important translators of uh, that brought um, the teachings into Chinese, like Kamara Jiva, aren't until around 400 CE. So as Musong puts it, he quotes, apparently religious Buddhism had enough of an impact on Chinese consciousness, even without scholarly understanding of the sutras, to provide them with a comprehensive view of Buddhist orthodoxy and to encourage them to undertake missionary activities into neighboring countries, end quote. This in turn is mimicked pretty quickly within Korea's own missionary work being sent to Japan only a couple hundred years after its own introduction. They sent statues and sutras to Japan in 552, although those dates are contested and may have been introduced formally a couple decades previously, but Buddhism greatly influenced a, a young Prince Shotoku, and by the late 6th century, only a couple decades later, he had become regent and succeeded in establishing a centralized government based on Buddhist teachings. More on that in a future discussion.
Now, before I get too ahead of myself, we should recognize that Buddhism may have been present in both of these places before these dates, but at least for the Korean Peninsula, Mu Song's point should not be lost. The fact that missionaries were being sent from China implies a certain appreciation and influence of Buddhist teachings before Buddhism was even doctrinally understood. There were few to no sutras in their own language before either Chinese or Koreans felt it important to help spread Buddhist teachings, thus emphasizing the importance that Buddhism had on the region on a whole. Slide to see. And what was a, a major contributing factor in, in the spread in Korea? Power. I mean, what else? Power. Up until um, Buddhism's introduction, the peninsula was made up of several warring states, tribes, clans. And over time, the main kingdom, kingdoms fought to establish political control. Goguryeo, Baekje, and Sila prevailed as the kingdoms um, that the period of time is named after. But um, they, they were in a constant state of threat and turmoil. So Buddhism was being imported as a way to provide the rulers with a belief system that provided good fortune and protection for the state. In this way, the spread of Buddhism was very much from the rulers down into the populace. And as much as the ruling class appreciated the, the Chinese version of Buddhism coming over with its nationalism, structure, and perspectives, the populace was able to build their faith through Amitabha and Maitreya worship in the form of Pure Land practices. However, it has been mentioned in previous talks and should always be reiterated, Buddhism, Buddhism did not um, supplant local folk religions. It was able to merely overlay the, the native culture. And thus, during this period, with a similar language, a more homogenous culture, and a religion to ground the society, the clan-centered tribalism quickly faded. Buddhism first arrived um, in the state of Goguryeo, uh, which comprised of much of what is now North uh, Korea and Lower Manchuria. They had received emissaries as early as 372 and recognized and adopted Buddhism as the state religion that same year. This would make sense considering the direct exposure this northwesternmost kingdom had from Silk Road roots coming down into the peninsula. But of course, we have to remember that Buddhism probably arrived before these dates, but the common public weren't the ones writing the history. So until it's formal int formally introduced to the court, we have no dates to really know when it actually arrived. With that said, Baekje um, was the next kingdom to uh, have Buddhism spread only about 12 years later in 384. Although their acknowledgement of um, Buddhism as a state religion didn't happen for another 150 years or so. Then the last kingdom to have Buddhism formally introduced was Silla, and not until uh, early, the early or to mid fifth century. This later introduction was more based on Silla's more conservative nature, because again, it is certain that Buddhism would have been generally exposed to the area, but its location on the southeastern coast of the peninsula also meant that it had much less direct influence from their big brother China. And there, uh, and there it was accepted as a state religion in 527. So by the latter half of the Three Kingdoms period, each territory was relying on teachings and rituals to help the ruling classes provide societal structure and protection. And thus, Buddhist temples and statues were being built en masse, which laid the foundation for massive cultural shift that would permeate Chinese, uh, Korean culture into the following centuries. Although very Chinese, it was during this time that this shift subsequently took on a more and more nuanced Korean flavor. Buddhism became more than just another Chinese import. It really rooted itself in Korean life, as we will continue to see. <laughs>
Now, without going into the whole history of Korea, as it may seem, I actually am doing, but um, the Kingdom of Silla succeeded in unifying most of the Korean peninsula in 668, um, giving rise to a period of political stability, comparatively, and therefore termed appropriately the Unified Silla period. Now, with a unified peninsula, there was less strife, less upheaval, with less tribalism and infighting. And the new cultural, and, and it provided, and Buddhism provided a new cultural viewpoint, which helped cultivate massive developments in art, poetry, music, architecture, etc. It also ushered a golden age of Buddhist scholarship. Monks were able to finally travel to China during the China, during then the Chinese Tang Dynasty. This would have been a peak of Chinese Buddhism at the time. Chan, Hua Hien, and Tiantai were all taking shape. Korean monks were studying, training, and helping to develop many of the schools that we have already discussed in previous talks. They would have been studying under various founders of those schools, leading some of those monks to stay in China, but most were bringing back those teachings back to Korea. And so new formalized schools of Buddhist thought were being introduced to the peninsula. All new seeds that would continue to grow just now in Korea. And here I'll make the distinction in that these schools would have been much more scholarly, doctrinal schools. Practice oriented schools like Chan were not brought over until much later and more on that in just a bit. Again, with a lot of overlap between these schools and not nearly as compartmentalized as we tend to see schools of Buddhism today, early trends of doctrinal schools at the time could be grouped in, the, in these types of ways. First was um, Yigol Jong, Jong is school in, in uh, Korean. This is the Vinaya school, uh, and the Vinaya being the early code of conduct um, outlined in the Pali Triptaka. The emphasis here uh, would obviously be on the study of living a moral and ethical, um, living by a moral and ethical code related to the Shila, Paramita, the ethics perfection. Nolban Jong, the Nirvana Sutra school, based on the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, and which extolled the teachings of Tathagatagarbha, uh, of that the innate Buddha nature found in all sentient beings. Yopsong Jong, um, the Dharma nature school, which is an interesting Korean form of thought tied closely to the Huayong uh, Zhong, it, it, the Huayan school. It focused on syncretism rather than sectarianism, not on the interpretation of a single sutra, but on the essential spirit of all the scriptures, the nature of the Dharma, as it were. Uh, Huayong Zhong, and I'm sorry, I'm butchering the pronunciation, please bear with me. This would have been the Tamsaka Sutra School, the Huahian in China um, becomes Kegong in Japan. This emphasizes the doctrine, uh, doctrine of the univer uh, of universal interpenetration. This would become one of the more uh, more popular and influential schools at the time in Korea. And then Pop Sang's Jong. This is the Yogacara School. Uh, it's a mind or consciousness only school, which teaches that uh, our experiences of reality um, come from our fallible minds. And so we should deepen and cleanse our or cleanse our consciousness as a way to see, perceive, experience a true nature of reality. These schools of thought may not have lasted in the long term in Korea, but their mark on the evolution of Buddhism's in, on the peninsula can be seen in all subsequent Korean schools. I should also throw in here, as I mentioned already, that yes, there, these are doctrinal schools, but underlying all of these, particularly outside of the court, amongst the general populace, pure land practices were widespread. Uh, not a distinct uh, school per se, but, as, uh, but the use of Amita, uh, Amida worship or Amitabha worship, um, Maitreya or Avakishabara worship, they all had a huge impact on the day-to-day -day lives of early Koreans. Yes, the uh, 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 aristocracy would equate any given ruler as a Buddha-like representation, but the Pure Land Doctrine provided hope for an otherwise suffering existence. 
Therefore, Pure Land teachings and practice would continually be a presence in Korean culture. Now, as I mentioned before, although Buddhism provided a huge cultural shift, it also provided a lot of power to the ruling class. And as the adage goes, power corrupts. Buddhism as an institution within Korea, uh, Korean society amassed tremendous wealth, influence, and power. And so over the unified Silla period, that decadence resulted in a stagnancy. Over time, practitioners turned off by that corruption started to turn towards practice, uh, more practice-oriented forms of Buddhism. Some of the more influential monks of that time started to really establish Chan, meditative practices, or in Korea, Son, later in Japan, Zen. Um, again, Son would have uh, already been present, but not as influential. So it wasn't until the early 9th century that Son would catch, um, catch on more distinctly. There was thus the establishment of the nine mountain schools. Mountains because, like the shamanistic folk religions that preceded them and preceded Buddhism, retreating to the mountains for isolation and practice culturally made sense. Its development was partly in opposition to the doctrinal schools of the capital. It was thus formed as anti-intellectual, which set a tone for future divisions between Son and Gyo. Uh, or doctrinal schools. This becomes important later on. These monks would have trained and studied, studied in China a sudden awakening form of Chan and came back to Korea to establish monasteries upon various mountains. Most of the nine schools had their own flavor, but those were more based on the differences of each individual personality of their founders rather than ideology on the whole. However, each had their own exploration and creative ways of trying to experience sudden awakening. Much like in China, they were experimenting new ways of trying to transmit a wordless insight. We discussed some of these techniques in our, in our discussion on Chan Buddhism, so I won't go over those here. But suffice it to say, Song Buddhism became more and more popular and started to gain attention on, uh, uh, within the elites and therefore did flourish. But as we will see, Buddhism on the whole in Korea was still riddled with problems that would affect the longevity of all schools in the centuries to come. <coughs> By the late eighth century, Silla began to experience political troubles. Silla uh, became increasingly weak and eventually crumbled. Thus, by the uh, early 10th century, the Goryeo period had begun. Now, Goryeo is actually the word that we then transliterate into Korea. Um, but Goryeo rulers were still highly Buddhist based, and much of the court would have either been ordained monks or general followers of Buddhist teachings. And so again, Buddhism was used to try to reestablish order and protection of the state. Now with the emphasis on both Son and Gyo doctrinal schools. But the societal structure would eventually erode Buddhism's influence. Many younger sons of uh, aristocratic families would become monks, which would lead to a little bit of nepotism and more donations of land and for the temples, etc., etc. But uh, this land would also be tax exempt, and some of the holdings would be vast areas of land, lending tremendous economic power. Monks were also exempt from civil or military service. Eventually, therefore, the Sangha became to be composed of those seeking wealth and power and status rather than awakening. Soon, and rightfully so, there was a backlash. And increasing regulations started to be put into place. These seeds of dissent of Buddhism's political influence would later become its undoing. However, on the whole, Buddhism continued to play a huge cultural role. But for those who were still genuine in their Buddhist pursuits, they were still able to study and train, further contributing to the growth and development of Korean forms of Buddhism. <coughs> and during this period, we continued to see huge temple complexes being established. And one of the greatest achievements can be seen in the picture here on the left um, of the entire Buddhist triptaka carved into wood block prints. So along the wall, you see them all stacked up on their side. 
endless supply of carved wood block prints. Now, each piece of wood had to be obviously tempered and uh, for th three years fermented and dried and then carved and, and then destroyed by the Mongols and then redone. But, um, but this would have been a huge advancement in the in suture re reproduction. But despite cultural, these cultural advances, the Son and Go schools continue to be at odds. However, a monk, Uchan, um, from the mid to late 11th century, attempted to bridge that gap between these two factions um, with the reintroduction of Chiantai, Tiantai school of thought. Again, Tiantai teachings would have been present in Korea, but was not of great influence. Nevertheless, it was Uichang's goal to reestablish it as its own viable school. He had seen the polarization of Son and Yo schools as unfortunate and criticized both. From Musong's book, he quotes Uichang, quote, the Dharma is devoid of words or appearances but it is not separate from words and appearances. If you abandon words, you are subject to distorted views and defilements. If you grasp at words, you are deluded as to its truth. Students of the scriptures often abandon their inner work and pursue, pursue externals. Son adepts, uh, adepts prefer to ignore worldly activities and simply look inward. Both positions are biases which are bound at two extremes. They are like fighting over whether a rabbit's horns are long or short, or arguing whether flowers in the sky are profuse or scarce. I love that, Andrew. <laughs> um, he saw both study and practice as integral and worked to remind both sides of these, uh, both both of these uh, those roots found in China, but which seem to have become a great divide between Son and Go schools. He made great advancements in promoting the Chiantai ideas, but he died young, and so Chiantai became just another contending school. However, Huichang's influence did last long enough to have an impact on another seminal Korean monk, Jinul, a Son monk who sought to bring samadhi, meditation, and prajna, wisdom, together. Upon, upon Mount Joge, uh, he established the Joge Order, which sought to have a comprehensive approach to Buddhism, including meditation, um, doctrine, chanting, and discourse. This form um, is one of the only Korean Son schools to still continue today. And this, this itself is a testament to its influence because, as I've alluded to several times, Buddhism on the whole went through a comparatively massive decline within Korea. From the latter Goryeo period onward, Confucian ideals were becoming more and more prevalent among the ruling classes, and with Buddhism's corruption and overwhelming power, the shift into uh, the Joseon dynasty in 1392, there was an outright rejection of Buddhism, primarily at the political and bureaucratic level that still continues today. During this period, Buddhist monasteries dropped from several hundred to only about 36. Limits were placed on the numbers of clergy, land area, the ages for entering the Sangha, etc. Monks and nuns were prohibited from entering cities or doing things like conducting Buddhist funerals, for example. The only respite that Buddhism may have had during this time was in the late 16th century uh, within the 16th century, uh, when monks were rallied to repel the colonial Japanese invasion. But obviously, we, we, have, uh, we have seen how this political distancing has evolved into the extreme with now, how North Korea now does not allow any religious uh, expression of any kind. 
There is a long history here, and I tried to cover a lot in a little amount of time. So please let me know if there's any particular things that I, I would love to dive into. Um, because but I, what I really wanted you to present here this evening it, it, for this installment of the East Asian Buddhism series is because Korea is often overlooked and glossed over, yet it holds an important role in the history of Buddhism in East Asia. For example, because of how much transmission happened from Chinese founders to Korean scholars, during periods of Chinese Buddhism, uh, Chinese Buddhism decline and suppression, it was Korea that brought a lot of those teachings back into China as a way to revive various schools, Tiantai included. Some of Buddhism um, being introduced to Japan came through the lens of Korean influence, as, we, as we'll go over in next month's discussion on early Nara Buddhism. So rather than dwell on the political corruption, which is more of a testament to uh, and a reflection of our infinite capacity for delusion, rather than something inherent about Buddhism, we should look at the use of the Dharma in Korea as an ethical foundation for societal structure. We saw this in China, we'll see this in Japan um, in later discussions. So let us focus on Buddhism's ability to provide a society with an argument for egalitarianism, non-sectarianism, environmentalism, strong ethical guidelines, and use those as a model for our own personal day-to-day -day lives and as a sangha to be able to make societal and cultural change. Anyway, um, Sensei. Um, I was just going to make a few comments to uh, clarify something for people who may not be aware of it. When we talk about Tiantai, that is Tendai in Japan. So Tiantai and Tendai are philosophically the same school. I mean, the Tiantai, Tendai, um, goes beyond the philosophy and there's a change in Japanese Tendai as opposed to uh, Chinese Tiantai. And Chiangtai is Tiantai right. from China too. So Chiangtai and Tendai have very similar, a very similar outlook. And it would, it, I think that part of the reason that you saw Chenul as, uh, even though he was a Song practitioner, he was really picking up on the Chiantai right. and the basic teaching of Tiantai, Tendai, and Chiantai are that you need study and practice in equal measure. And that, that shouldn't be uh, misplaced. So I just wanted to clear up some of the language. Yes. And, it, and just to bring it forward to today, um, when I was teaching Asian studies uh, you know, at the university, I would often say when people would say to me, well, what are the Buddhist nations in East Asia? And I would list, of course, Korea as well. But I would then say the most Confucian nation in Asia is Korea. <laughs> And then go on to let people know that about a third of the population of Korea is Buddhist. About a third population today is is um, a Christian, and about a third of the population are purely animists, as more what we would call shamanist. Mm -hmm. And so shamanism is is really dominant throughout, whether you're Christian or you're Buddhist. Mm -hmm. But about a third of the population claims affiliation with Buddhism, about a third of the population claims affiliation with Christianity, a third of the population say I'm only a uh, uh, shamanist, but all three are shamanist in, in fact, in practice. Uh, in the same way that you look at Japan, and while the population is uh, predominantly Buddhist, they're also at the same time predominantly Shinto. There's so there's a correspondence mm -hmm. in that in that respect. Shintoism being very uh, not synonymous with shamanism, but very similar mm -hmm. to shamanism. Uh, so I was just gonna going to point that out. Thank you so much, Yeah, yeah and, and to piggyback, uh, the the Buddhism that was being brought into Korea already had um, much of uh, many Confucian and Taoist influences embedded within it. Um, and so that's why I, t I say things like it, it, it was fairly nationalistic because and did help to uh, 
um, provide rulers with some sort of structure because it did have a lot of those types of elements already embedded. Um, so uh, any other questions, thoughts, comments? I'm going to stop the recording. Oh, stop the recording, please. Thank you.